Number one, locking the camera. So we've all been there. You spend minutes, maybe hours, <laughs> setting up your perfect camera angle. And then you continue working on your scene and do some steps here, move that, whatever. And then you notice afterwards, oh crap, I forgot to untick my camera and now I ruined my camera position. Now there's two ways you can stop that, that I know of. The first one is using a protection tag. So let me just undo the camera movement real quick. There we go. Uh, just add the protection tag, right click, uh, rigging tags and protection. Now what this tag does, it basically blocks whatever axis you want it to block, which means you could only, you know, block the camera axis. So you can still move the camera around, but you, you, you can't rotate or you can just block it completely and you can, can't do anything anymore with your camera. And you can't even move it if you, if you try to do it with tools or anything. It's completely locked now. You can't scale it, you can't rotate it. The second way to do this is just going to whatever frame and then setting keyframes for all the relevant properties of the camera, which is normally uh, position and rotation. What this does is you can still move the camera, but as soon as you switch one frame on the timeline, it's going to switch back to its original position, which is basically the same as the protection tag, but you can still you can still move it move it without going out of the out of the camera all the time. Number two, placing objects above and below. This is a rather small and short tip, but it's uh, pretty useful nonetheless. Um, whenever you want to add deformers or subdivision surface or anything to the scene, what you have to do is, you know, add the object and then drag it below, which can get pretty tedious if you have a huge, huge, huge hierarchy in your object manager. Uh, the alternative is selecting the relevant object and for deformers, for example, keep pressing shift and then click the deformer and it's going to be automatically applied under the object you currently selected. And then it just works like a charm. For stuff that needs to go above the object, whatever that object is, just keep pressing alt and do the same thing. And it's going, the object is going to be below whatever you select, uh, sorry, above whatever you selected. Number three. Object order does matter. Something that is not very obvious from the get-go, especially if you learn the program, is that the order of things in your object manager here matter. Uh, as an example, I have the cylinder here and I apply, applied a bent deformer. And let's say now I want to taper off the cylinder to the top. Now if I add the taper deformer, uh, if I can find it, it's here. All right. Um, and I drag it below and then I fit it to parent and at the strength, oh God, what is happening? Now what's happening here is that the order of the deformers in the object manager are not correct in the way that I want it to behave. So if I drag the taper deformer above the bend deformer, it's first going to tamp, uh, taper the cylinder like that and then it's going to bend it. And this is something that is not inherently obvious if you start using the program, but it's important for many, 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 many other things. The order of the objects in the object manager matter. Number four, the commander. This is another really short tip, but a really, really useful one that just speeds up your workflow immensely if you remember to use it. Um, as an example, let's say I have this object here and I want to uh, make a spline out of... Uh, let's say this selection here. So instead of going through the menu and searching for a tool that I rarely use, I just use the commander and the commander is opened up by pressing shift C and then you just type in some keyword, whatever, whatever it is. In this case, edge to spline. Then you press enter and bam, you have your spline or whatever you want to do. You can find anything in there, almost anything. Um, mo text, uh, subdivision surface, bend, even commands, solo commands, whatever, whatever floats your boat, you can find inside the commander. So shift C for the commander to find commands really fast. Number five, the spacebar. 
So let's say you want to make or have to make a lot of extrusions on a lot of different parts of your model. So you have to select the parts of your model and then extrude and then select again and extrude. And there's a way to um, extremely speed this up. So instead of, you know, um, selecting the polygons and then going right click, uh, extrude or, you know, pressing MT, extrude, select the selection tool again, MT, extrude. What you can do instead is use your selection tool, then use the extrude tool and then press space and then press space again and then press space and then press space again. So what this does is, is basically it switches between the selection tool you, you last used and then the tool you last used, which means in this case, if I take the lasso selection and select some polygons and then press space, I can extrude. And if I then press space again, it's going to take the lasso selection tool again. So space to switch between last selection tool and last used tool. And it can be anything that can even be, you know, um, the weld command, for example, space, weld, space, weld, space, weld, or whatever, actually, whatever you lose, you used last, you can switch between with space. Very, very handy. Number six, reset PSR. All right, so I'm pretty sure I'm not alone. And I did this for years. Um, let's say I want this sphere to be on the exact same position as this cube. Now, what you normally would do is, you know, put the sphere under the cube, then make sure you're under relative object space, and then you zero out all the locations, uh, X, Y, Z positions and rotations. So for example, if this cube has rotation, oh, sorry, oh, if this cube has rotation as well, and is in some really weird position, instead of trying to move it there, you just put it below the cube, make sure you're under object relative, and then you zero out all the coordinates except the scale, which can be super annoying if you're using a lot of objects. Now, what they changed in release 21 is that this specific button, and it's actually a big question why this hasn't been done earlier, um, this this step you do when, when you zero out all the coordinates and all the rotation has a button now in the interface and it's a new button right here, PSR. And it basically does the same thing. As soon as you place the object under the other object, it's going to zero out the relative position to the object. Uh, as I said, this is only for R21, but you, of course the tool still exists in older Cinema 4D editions. So you either use the commander, and choose reset PSR. In this case, I have to select it, of course, and it does the same thing. Or you just add it to your toolbar with the customization menu. And I'm pretty sure many people used to zero out the position and the rotation for many, many years. And not a lot of people know about this stupid PSR button because it's hidden in the menus. Number seven, customize your interface. Now this next tip won't be relevant too much for everyone because the standard cinema for the inter cinema for the interface is pretty good already but especially if you're using a lot of plugins for the love of god change your interface it's such a game changer if you have all the buttons you need for your, you you know for your uh, third party render engine like octane or cycles in your standard menus instead of these stupid drop down menus where you click and then you search for the specific object every single time Instead of that, just change your stupid layout. And the way to do that is you go under Window, Customization, and then Customize Commands. And then you just click Edit Palettes, and then you search for whatever, whatever you want to have. For example, Cycles. Uh, that, wasn't, that wasn't very helpful. Um, CI Environment, for example. It's a bit tedious sometimes finding the things you need, but you can still click here and just see how the things are, are named and then find it. So, for example, if I want my cycle stuff here, I just uh, go camera. I see the cycles camera. I drag and drop it here. I want the cycles lights. Um, CI light probably. No. 
right here, CI spotlight, CI ring light, you get the point. And the thing is now, you can also add spacers because this is, you know, these are the spaces between. You can have a group separator. You can also have an icon separator that is way smaller, or you can have a fill space, which basically just fills the rest of the space. And the thing about changing the interface is if you now close cinema and you open it up again, it's going to be the default interface. If I change the interface here and go back to startup user or whatever, it's going to be reset. What you have to do is go to window customization and then save layout as, and for example, in this case, we just call it tutorial. And now we have a new interface set up here besides all the others that is called tutorial and it's different from the startup. These icons are missing. So change your layout and then don't forget to save it or you maybe you spend half an hour changing your layout and then it's all gone and then you have to redo it all over again. Save your layouts, change it, huge game changer. And number eight, use the documentation. Final tip for today, and one of the most important things I tell everybody that starts out using the software or doesn't do that already is use the Cinema 4D help system. Cinema 4D has one of the best, if not the best help systems in the industry, as far as I can tell, and you can use it on basically anything. Like, for example, if you're in the bevel deformer in this example scene and you don't know what the bevel mode does, just right click the bevel mode, click on show help and it's going to open up the help system and show you exactly what the bevel mode does. Oftentimes with example pictures, like in this case, um, and explanations, what does what and what you even what you use it for, because sometimes, you know, you have settings in some deformer or in MoGraph that you understand the name of, like what it does, but what the fuck would I actually use it for? And this is where the help system is really great and where the Cinema 4D documentation is just different from other software's documentation. If you have ever worked with After Effects or anything and you go to the, the Adobe website and you just look up some setting or something, the explanations are just not great. Sometimes or oftentimes you get out of the documentation and you're not any smarter than you were before, but the Cinema 4D documentation is different. And as I said, you can basically right click anything and get help for it. Whatever it is, if it's a setting, if it's an object, if it's just a camera, and there's just tons of tons of documentation and examples and pictures for everything that the program offers. The only problem is if you work with uh, third party, plugins like Octane or Cycles or X-Particles, this doesn't work. Uh, X-Particles and Cycles 4D, for example, have the big advantage that they offer a question mark button in everything that they deliver, but most other plugins don't. And in this case, you have to rely on their, uh, the documentation on their website, which is a bit, a bit disappointing that not more people integrate it, but you know, I understand it. But for everything Cinema 4D related, if you're just learning the program or learning a new tool, just hop into the documentation and look up what the, what the thing does and what it can do. Because I can tell you, you will learn a lot just by reading the documentation, just by seeing, oh, I can use it this way as well. And this is probably the most important tip I can, I can give anybody using Cinema 4D or learning Cinema 4D is read the documentation, use it whenever you can, use it when you don't understand something.